All right, all right, all right. Up and running. Up and live here again as I plug away on this. Uh, I've made some progress here in the last couple of days in terms of the uh, the item system and how it's going to work. Uh, I've played around with uh, with this system that I uh, that I purchased and uh, uh, made good progress in terms of being able to uh, merge my own randomization system into it. So originally I was using a. Uh, let me head over here and show you this. Originally, I was using uh, what is called enumeration. And here I have on the left a list of all the creatures and on the right a list of all of the uh, descriptions of said creatures. And, uh, and that system was working fairly well with what I was doing in terms of items and how you would find them. Uh, but once I purchased this system uh, from the mar mar marketplace that uh, would work in third person... Uh, it meant that I had to alter the way that I was doing uh, my my stuff. And so um, I did that. I, uh, I started altering the way that I was doing my stuff. And what I've got now is a little bit of a hybrid system. And uh, I've got some functionality here. So for instance, if I go and find this teapot here, which is one of my items sitting on the shelf, and I select it, uh, it tells me now that this is the Mini Audrey 2. What a cute little plant. You should feed it, Seymour. Feed it. Go on. What harm could come from that? And I can tumble around and see this object here. I can take said object or I can put said object back, which currently these don't do anything. I can click them, but they're, they're not going to do anything. Um, and so that system does work. And if you, if you select the teapot here, uh, you'll see down here that it uh, inside of the variables that I currently have selected, uh, the variable file name tells me that this is Plantius, the name of the creature uh, that the Audrey 2 is, is associated with. The Audrey 2 is here and Plantius is here. And if I move this thing around, you'll see that constantly shift and move. And the idea here is that um, wherever I place this in the world, it'll give me a random version of one of these, uh, one of these critters. And so... Uh, if I were to go and hit play again, I have now a different version of that. It won't be the Audrey 2. This is now Bouquet of Flowers. A dry bouquet of flowers, from what you can only imagine, was an incredibly beautiful wedding. It makes you wonder whatever became of the people who pledged their undying love for one another. I guess you'll never know. Uh, obviously, I've got to fix the text here on Bouquet of Flowers. Uh, but then this will be the Bouquet of Flowers. So this is obviously the bride. Um, with the Bouquet of Flowers here being her, her item. And so that uh, that is working exceptionally well. Uh, I'll be able to move these items all throughout the world. Now, the one catch with my random system as it is set up currently... Um, is that I don't have a master list of all of the items, which means it's going to be a pain in the butt uh, to place them everywhere in the world. Right now, I'm doing this inside of the construction script um, for... Where are you? Not this guy. This guy. So inside of the construction script here is where I'm running my randomize the totems. And, uh, and it might just be that I don't want to randomize them, that I actually want to, uh, to manually go and place them. Uh, and the reason for that is that the, within the random, uh, it's going to be hard to get all 50 items into my world. And, uh, you know, that, that sucks. I want all 50 in there. But it also means I won't be able to place any items that I want placed. Um, meaning, um... I won't be able to, uh, for instance, a couple of them are going to be hats. And I thought it would be great to have a hat rack somewhere. And I could just put a couple of the hats on the hat rack. And depending on which hat you pick up, you know, that, that does one of your things. So um, because of that, I don't know that I'm going to go random with this. I might actually just manually place them. And so anyway, the, uh, the random system I kind of got going... Um, but I'm just noticing way too many flaws with it at this point in time. And so, uh, yeah, it might not be that I go random with this uh, at all. And so, um, because of that, 
I'm going to alter the system here, which currently has my random totem system in it. And uh, I'm actually going to go and uh, set this, this up in a different way. Uh, I'm going to set it up in such a manner that uh, that instead of getting random items, uh, we're going to use a, a list to uh, to populate this. So when I go and drag uh, one of these things into the world, I'm going to give it a, uh, instead of right here where I have these variables that show me what object this is, uh, I'm going to instead make it so that there's just a number here. But I can give it a value of anywhere between 1 and 50 or 0 and 49, uh, which will then go and populate the right teapot into that area. And so that is the that is the goal, uh, and that fi that should fix all of my issues. I should be able to get all 50 items in here. Uh, and again, that'll make it so that in my blueprints here, I have only just a singular blueprint that I'll be able to, uh, to shift and move around. And so uh, here's hoping that that's going to work. Uh, this is what I'm going to work on here for the next little while. And, uh, and as I've done for the last couple of days, uh, while I'm just plugging away on doing this stuff, I'm going to be listening to some music. So I'm going to kill the audio here until uh, that'll probably be a couple hours uh, until I've got enough people here that are uh, uh, going to be interested in communicating back and have questions and whatnot. And so once I've got a, a live audience uh, with whom I will be communicating, I will uh, I will go quiet and uh, and I'll come back once uh, once this is uh once this is all going. And so, uh, yeah, have fun, keep watching, and, uh, and I'll be back in, uh, in a short amount of time, uh, at least vocally.
Hello, hello, hello. All right, so I got some audio again. So uh, what I'm in the process of doing here is uh, trying to pass a variable from one blueprint to another. And uh, the way that the system works is I have a couple of actors here. Um, I have an actor that lives in the world, which is this guy here. I'm on the shelf. And, uh, and that actor in the world, if I go over here. So the way that the system works is I have the thing that I've placed in the world, which had collision and fell through the world. Um, this stuff has collision. Looks like my bowl tipped over a little bit, but that's okay. But I can, uh, I can highlight this stuff if I can get to the point that I can... There it is. See it. There it is. And when I click... What happens is it's spawning another mesh right here. This is a different blueprint, a different actor. And, uh, and this actor, I'm trying to reference whatever the first object was in order to, to generate uh, the model here so that I get the right model that we can interact and look at. Now, I am passing that information uh, correctly here. Uh, you can see that it says garlic, and, uh, and I get the, the right write up here. And so uh, I am passing that information correctly from one node to another. Um, now that where that uh, UI element is getting the uh, getting its information is actually just from the same place that this model is getting its information. So you can see, uh, excuse me, I have here a uh, a description which is uh, where it says that it's it's garlic. There's the the totem name. It's garlic. And then the description, uh, which is what appears in that little window. Um, now, I should double check and see that I am not actually doing that, doing what I think I'm doing. Uh, widgets and examine. So here is the object name, which is getting its reference from, where are you calling your reference? Let's go into the graph. Uh, object description and object name. Uh, so yeah, so they're calling themselves from these variables here. Um, there's nothing in there. You can go back. Close that. Um, and so yeah, so that's that's kind of working correctly. It's 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 grabbing that information and moving it over. Uh, this big long here mess. This these are the fifty totems that I have. And I'm assigning uh, a mesh to them based off an enumeration table. So essentially, what I'm doing is I, I give myself a variable. That variable uh, is a number that lines up to one of these objects. If it's number one, then the first one fires off, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so uh, right now, I'm on number 19, which is in here somewhere, vampire. That's where the garlic is. And, uh, and when I set that in the world to 19, we see that it lines up with garlic. We get the garlic mesh to appear. If I were to go and swap this out from garlic to 20, we'll see the next item in the list, which is werewolf. Um, and the mesh changes. Right now, I don't have a, a werewolf mesh. Uh, right now, that one uh, meshes totems. You'll see that my werewolf mesh is the teapot too. Right now, the everything else is teapots as well. That's why I'm using the garlic. It's the only one that I've got something in is as a placeholder. And so the idea here is that I want to pass a variable from one to the other. And typically, when you do this in Unreal, um, you do it via the um, uh, event dispatchers, where you can actually fire off. Essentially, you're kind of using the world as a translator. So you fire the variable from a blueprint into the world, and then the other blueprint picks it up from the world and can and can use it there. Um, however, that's not going to work for me. And the reason it's not going to work for me, and I can show you this in real time here. Uh, let me close my static meshes. So if you look at the number of blueprints in my world, it's limited to this guy right here, this one. BP pickup child master. That's the bowl of garlic. And when I hit play, you'll see over here as well, BP child master. There's still only one blueprint. There's a few more that have spawned. We've got camera network manager, game session, 
player state. And so a couple of other, others are here, but that's still the only blueprint that's mine. And if I go and pick up the garlic, if I can get it to line up, there it is. Click. So as soon as I click up the garlic, um, you can see over in the blueprint window, uh, what is it? If 10 to pop out of here. So if you look over in the blueprint window, I now not only have BP pickup child master, but it created an instance of the other blueprint. That instance isn't in the world. It's not something that exists. It was spawned specifically for this, for this case. Um, and when I'm done with it, when I hit put back, it gets destroyed. And so that that kind of cleans up the world it makes sure that i don't have well a i'm going to end up with 50 you know versions of this of this blueprint in my world i want to make sure that i don't have to have 100 you know 50 that are visible and 50 that are invisible until i need them so i want to spawn them on the fly which is why i'm trying to get this set up and so yes um the idea now is to uh try and see if i can pull that variable uh, called totem number um, from one blueprint to the other. Now, the way that you do this, you'll see if I wire this up and I compile this, we get an error, which is saying that this blueprint class here is not a uh, child or uh, a descendant of uh, the blueprint in which this is found, um, which is the only way you can pass these variables to one another. So I would need a target, something that I can actually go in and fire into this object. Um, and I need a reference to child master uh, EP child master object. So I would actually need something in the world that is that BP child uh, master reference object that I can that I could grab um, in order for to to pass that number in here. Now I cannot add a blueprint as a component. Uh, so, for instance, if I go back into where my blueprints are and we grab the uh, base blueprints, there's my child master. And if I try and bring the child master into the actor and just place them in here, well, that did work. Well, I'll be damned. It's not supposed to work. Uh, okay. So, if I take this and I say uh, totem number, not going to work. Get, not got, get, toad, yeah, there's no get totem in. There's my get totem name, get totem number. So that's the thing that I need, but you can see that I can't, I can't actually wire this up to this. Um, and because it's not it's not a compatible reference. And so hence my error in trying to uh, trying to work out the best way to do this now. Uh, one of the things that I had thought of doing is adding a variable that is a uh, an actor that is that object class um, to see if I can call it from there. So for instance, if I were to make this a variable, and this variable were this guy, and I were to say uh, actor, and I compile this, that should work. Uh, but I don't know that this variable will have the right information in it. You know what it is, is it's just wrapping your brain around the, the logic, right? Figuring out, okay, uh, if this, then that. And if you can follow the logic of what happens when I do this and what happens when I do that, uh, eventually you can get to a point where hopefully things on you work. And so here too, obviously, this did not work. Now, one of the problems that I have is that I, I have no idea what mesh this is. Um, this could be a teapot. It, could also not be the teapot uh, because I have a default item in here, <laughs> this guy, which is the teapot. And so it might be that I'm seeing that. It might not. It might be that I'm not. Uh, let's go see assign mesh. 
Okay. That does that. I don't think I'm actually calling a sign mesh. I'm not. So this was not going to work regardless. So I'm going to do this. And do this. And let's see if the garlic works now. So I don't know that this is going to pass the variable the right way, but uh, we'll give it a whirl. Oop. And so no, it did not pass the variable the right way. Oh, and it did give me a warning. Uh, assign, assign. Uh, access none while trying to read property. Blueprint, BP inventory, child master, function, assign mesh, graph, assign mesh, node, switch on Ian, creature list. Oh. Oh. Well, that's a different error. Uh, let's go into the here. Oh, yeah, it didn't get, so it didn't get a variable here. Um, it tried to assign something here, but nothing came through the pipe. So, uh, this was compiled. Uh, this is an actor, and you can see that I can't, uh, I can't go and assign this. And so, yeah, so that's, that is not going to work. It was my attempt at making it work. What should happen here, um, if I can actually just create an integer, create a temporary... Let's delete this variable and just create an integer or a byte. Let's create a byte. We'll put the byte here. I'll put the byte in here. So if this byte, we'll compile that as a value of 19, which is what I'm trying to pass here for my other system, if that were to be the case, when I get that to actually work, what'll happen is I'll end up with my bowl of garlic that I can go and interact with. And so I'll be able to go and look at, look at the lovely bowl of garlic. Uh, I can see here too that the, uh, the mesh is misaligned. I've got a blur on here again. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to fix that FOV as well. Uh, I'm going to have to make it more global. But anyway, there's a bowl of garlic. And so that's that's what I should see. Right? And I hit put back and the bowl of garlic looks like it's back in the world. And so it's kind of an illusion. You know, it makes it look like you actually picked up the item and you're interacting with it. But you're, you're not really. It's just spawning something new. So I need to... I need to jump my object over across there. And, and really the only reason I'm doing this is trying to avoid having a folder full of blueprints. Uh, right now I've got one called master. And if, if, I, if I make this system the way that it was intended to be used, I'm going to end up with 50 blueprints in here and 50 blueprints in here, which is not what I want. That's going to be way too many blueprints and uh, being I'd, I have to wire everything together and set all the variables inside. I'd much rather do it automatically if I can, where the system just recognizes, oh, hey, you're this thing. Let me go and, and plug that value in for you. And so um, that is why I'm doing, trying to do this in a way that, uh, that makes sense. And so I need to pass my variable from this guy, total number. Uh, which I don't even know where that's being assigned. That's get. Oh, I'm 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 assigning that. Yeah, I'm doing that manually. Um. Well, now here's the thing. If I'm doing this manually, why do I need it to be in here and global? Maybe I put it in the level blueprint. Hey, hey, Mister Bray. How you doing, sir? Okay, I'm going to create a new variable. Uh, this is going to be an integer type, I believe. Let's make it a byte. And this is going to be item number. And let's compile and let's default it 19. Okay, I'm actually going to put var in front of this for variable. Item number. And uh, we'll delete this guy. Yes, yes. 
And plug this back in here. Like this. So can I get a reference to hey, I know you don't work. But can I get a reference to var um item number? No. Var get var totem. Neither of those is right. What did I call it? This one. Var item number. Let's Try that again. Totem number. Save. Got a default value of 19. Have I heard about The Last of Us 2? Turns out a lot of spoilers were wrong. I, uh, yeah, don't really care much about that game. Uh, I'm I'm a hundred percent positive that the spoilers were not wrong, and that they pivoted and uh, and edited their game. Uh, based off where the spoilers were coming from, um, and the fact that the spoilers I don't know if you saw any of them, but the spoilers were cutscenes from the game that were on YouTube. That's that's not something that that can be wrong. You know, it's not like they had fake trailers or fake cutscenes to psych people out. And so they probably pivoted and just manipulated the game to do something else. But yeah, I got I got so little interest in that game. Uh okay. Cabin in the Woods. This is my VAR totem number. This has been done. If I go here, VAR totem number. Let's do this. Not out there. Uh, okay. I th thought that might have worked. Uh, level blueprint to blueprint. Oh yeah. Yeah, they were going they were going mental at the studio. And and a leak, a leak like that. So I don't know if you heard about where the leak came from. Um but I think it was it was a leak through Amazon if I remember correctly. So they use AWS um as their uh their their kind of like server provider uh where they store things from the game while they're working on it. And the way that the leak came about was that somebody noticed that uh, during Uncharted 4's development, if they went into the server for Uncharted 3, they saw content from Uncharted 4, making them realize that they reused the same server. And so once Uncharted 4 was out, they went back in and just watched uh, what, what happened, and nothing showed up. And so it made someone go and look at uh, the first Last of Us, to find out uh, what kind of server information they were using there. And they ended up getting the the information as to where their server was uh, from that. And uh, yeah, that made them... It's fucking horrible. Um, and that, that gave them the ability to go get into it. And so, yeah, kind of a crazy, crazy thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things that like it's... You can't, you can't do that, right? You can't have somebody lift cutscenes from your server and then have them be incorrect. You know that would that would be a lot of work um, to make an entire duplicate stuff. And so my assumption is that they pivoted. Um, I don't know what you heard about the spoilers. Uh, I don't want to divulge anything uh, here in case somebody doesn't want to hear them. Um, but they were fucking stupid. And and I think that was one of the one of the reasons they were getting a lot of flack was that what they were doing in the game, the, the story choices that they had made was just utterly nonsense and people were getting pretty pissed off about it. And so uh for that reason, um Yeah. Yeah, I did I did uh I didn't watch any of them, but I went and read what the information on the spoilers wa uh, was and uh and I was yeah, I was 
I was like, yeah, that's, that goes along pretty closely with what I think about Neil Druckmann's writing. Um, it was just really, really half-assed and didn't make a lot of sense. And um, it made you not like lead characters. It made you not like the characters that, that were there. And I, it was one of those things that they're like, oh, my God, this will be great. People are going to get, uh, there's going to be so much shock value when they do this thing in the game. And uh, and when people read about it, instead of getting the shock value, people were just like, you're fucking stupid. Why would you do that? Um, which is probably why they pivoted and did something else with it. Um, I can imagine. But uh, but anyway, I've got very little interest in playing that game. When uh, when it finally comes to PlayStation as a uh, a free PlayStation Plus game, I may consider getting it. Uh, until then... Forget about it. Forget about it. Um, they have announced, I don't know if you read this or not, this is brilliant, but uh, Sony lettered a statement about the PS5, because I guess everybody's going mental about the cost of this stupid thing. And uh, Sony lettered a statement that says... Um, they're not concentrating on price, they're concentrating on what you get for the price. Uh, which everybody took as code for it's going to be really expensive. <laughs> and so, uh, you probably expect to see... One of the, one of the guys I was, uh, I was reading an, an article he'd written, um, his journalist had predicted that it was going to be closer to a thousand bucks, which I don't think it'll be that high, that's mental. Um, but I think you'll see something in, in Canadian dollars, I think you'll see something 700 I think you'll see six ninety nine for this thing, um, which is just mental. Like I'm not, I'm not buying a PlayStation if that's if that's how much they're going to be. Forget about it. Eight ninety nine, yeah. They somebody did a uh, somebody did a tally of what it costs to um, a tally of what it costs to um, uh, build the PlayStation. So essentially taking all of the hardware components and adding all up, you know, what each of these components cost. So what it costs Sony to build the thing. And I think it was somewhere like five, five eighty nine, something like that, 589 bucks. And that was just to build it. And that's not including labor or any of the, the marketing or any of the, um, uh, distribution and getting it sent out to places. And so, you know, if they take a bath on it, if they lose money on it, they can sell it for 600 bucks. But if they plan on making any kind of money on it, man, that's, that's mental. Uh, the PS4, if I remember correctly, was $499. Um, if that's... I'm remembering correctly. I think the PS3 was $599 and the PS4 was $499. Uh, PS3 initial cost. Let's see if we can... Wow, that's a small font. Okay. Whoa, too big, too big, too big. Um, introductory price was $499 US. Uh, and the 60 gig model was $599. Which, again, why would you buy 20 gigs? That was stupid. Um, but yeah, so it was six, 600 bucks for the better model for the PS3 and the PS4. Was I think a hundred bucks cheaper? Uh, I didn't see a cost. Graphics online. There it is there. Um, in the United States, Canada, but a place also you raise a place Uh, there's the yen. Pounds. North America, three ninety nine, right here. So, uh, they say three ninety nine North America, uh, which is three ninety nine U S. Again, and so. It's uh, going to be a step up, man. Yeah. 
Well, you know what? If you look at uh, what Microsoft has just said, uh, Microsoft put out a statement about an all-digital Xbox. Uh, Lockhart, I think is what it's called. Um, Xbox Lockhart. So Xbox Lockhart is... <clears throat> This is something that just, just came out. Uh, this article is probably from a day or two, like 14 hours ago. Um, so the Xbox is revealing that... the hell is this? Go away. Um, they have another console coming out called Lockhart. Um, we're not talking just the Xbox uh, Series X, but there's another one that right now is only codenamed Lockhart, which is an all-digital version of the Xbox. And Microsoft has said that when it comes out, uh, it'll be $100 cheaper than a PS5. That is mental, man. $100 cheaper than a PlayStation? If they're able to do that, that's, that's it for Sony. There's no way Sony can beat that. I don't care how many exclusive studios you've got under your belt. You're not selling a console when your rivals are selling them for 100 bucks cheaper. When it's when it's the same games, right? Again, it, it this all comes down to uh, exclusivities. Now, here's the thing: there's a new Spider-Man coming, and by new, I mean the same fucking game. They just added another Miles Morales mission, so that's what Sony announced. Um, there's obviously a new God of War in the works, but at four years to develop, we're only maybe halfway into that, so probably a couple more years before that's ready. Uh, there's a New Horizon, which, granted, you know, looks cool as shit, and I would probably want to play that. Um, but I'm not going to spend 800 bucks on a console to, to play Horizon. That's, that's mental. I got the broken? Me and my broken. Oh, it just doesn't work anymore? Your, your PS5 is broken? Or your PS4 is broken? That sucks, dude. I tell you, though, when when a lot of games start shifting over to... Like, I've, I've still got Stadia. They've dropped the price of Stadia for the uh, the Pro version with the controller. They dropped it down to 100 bucks, which is... I'm like, that's nothing now. And talking about an $800 PlayStation and a $100 Stadia controller. <clears throat> that's, that's nothing. And, uh, and, and games like... You know, Cyberpunk are going to be available on both. I'm not buying an $800 console. If I can play, if I can play Cyberpunk without buying anything, but the game, I'm in. That's what I'm doing. Uh, okay. I'm having a hard time sending this variable from place to place. Uh, <clears throat> oh, that's too bad, dude. I'm sorry to hear that. It sucks. It's you know what? It's one of the it's one of the downsides of being an early adopter, right? You uh, you buy stuff when it first comes out, and you're the guinea pig. You're the one that's gonna. And I'm I'm in the same boat. I've got a day one PS4 in my living room. That is dying a very slow death. Or no, it's in my studio. My uh, PS4 Pro is in the living room. Um, but yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a brutal. Uh, okay. Uh, global variables. I gotta try and find a way of sending this variable from place to place, and I can't can't figure out how to do it. Create a blueprint actor because you're going to put it uh, put it in your level. It has to be an actor. Call it level database actor. Place your new level database actor in your level. I put it at zero zero zero. Uh, add edit the blueprint of your LDA. Steam summer sale last year. 
uh, let me buy Cyberpunk at half price. It was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I don't play much on, you know what, I don't play much on Steam um, because then I have to sit on my computer. And since I sit on my computer for work, I don't want to sit on my computer for games. I don't want to, I don't want to sit in the same chair uh, for relax and fun as I do when I'm working. I'd rather go sit on my couch and relax. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this guy's got a good solution for this, and I'm going to see if this works. So I'm going to go to my blueprint class here. Yeah, well, you're not alone. Uh, inspected object. So this is a nothingness, right? I've got nothing in here. Let's delete these variables. They're not doing anything. Construction script's empty. Okay, so this is a blueprint that I made at some point, and it's not doing anything. So I'm going to rename this blueprint, and I'm going to do it here. Uh... So, uh, variables that I want. There's a static mesh in here. I can't delete static mesh. Oh, it's up here. Box. I don't think I need that either. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to make a variable. And I'm going to make this a byte. And I'm going to call this um, totem number. I'll call it var. Var totem number. And we'll save this. I'm going to dock this. We're going to go into the level blueprint. And I'm going to remove the var from here. I don't need it. And now I've got it in here. Um, I'm going to give it a, well, I'll give it a default value of zero for now. And I'll hit OK. Uh, compile, save, close. And then I'm going to bring in, I'm going to rename this thing. This is the one, right? Var, this is the one. So I'm going to rename this. And this is going to be my level database actor. CP level database actor. And I'll throw this in the world. And I'll move it to the origin. And I now have a variable over in here. Oh, this is not going to work. Because I need to set this thing's variable from the other blueprint. Well, Shazbot. This might work. We'll see if this works. Okay. Uh, oh, I also need to make that variable global so that I can see it. Okay. So now, I'm going to go to my uh, child master, this guy. Totem number. So here, I've got a totem number that's being set by the blueprint. And what I want to do is I want to use this value to set the one in the LDA. Uh, so get all actors class. Class is my BP LDA. Okay. Uh, get. I'll leave it at zero. So now I've got that. Now I've got that. Uh, bubbity, 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 bum. So from here, let's set bar number. Okay. I'm going to move this up here. Plug this in here. And we're going to set this value here. Uh, current array pin is invalid. Oh, uh, this is not being fired. 
Let's make sure it gets fired. Get that. Then do that. Then do this. Okay. So let's make sure we still see garlic in the world. Yahoo, there's a bowl of garlic over here. Uh, that if I was clever enough, I could see it. There it is. Okay, so now, uh, in this one, compile. Okay, and what I need to do here is the same system here. This, this, this. Copy. Paste. Paste. So, again, we're going to assign mesh. We're going to get that actor. We're going to set that here and put that here. But now I'm not going to set, I'm going to get. Instead of setting this, I'm going to get it instead. So out from here, get var totem number. And this should be able to go in there. And this should be able to go in here. Okay, compile. Uh, let's make sure that I didn't go and set this. So that's not garlic. Let's go see. See if this actually works. Uh, I've got no mouse. There we go, mouse. I've got no look. There's my look. And we got a bowl of garlic. Put it back. Okay. To test if the system actually freaking works. All right. So just to make sure that the system is actually doing what it's doing, I need another totem. Um, I really wish this guy had a bigger collision volume. I might make... I might actually go and make a sphere collision for this. Um, actually, I don't want it to roll around. I'm going to make a box collision. Like this. So let's make this... Uh, oh, really? 44. 44. Yeah, that's how big it should have been. Hmm. Place us at the origin. So the collision on this object is what um, is what I'm interacting with when I'm identifying it, and that's why I'm having issues targeting the thing. Is that it's it's a little too small, and I don't want to oversize the garlic. That wouldn't make sense. And I was trying to make a, a larger bowl of garlic, but uh, um, it just gets too too heavy in the polygons. I don't want a hundred thousand polys of garlic in here. That's mental. Um, and and again, since I'm just going to be looking at this thing full screen, you know, I don't I want to actually have that many polys. Uh, let's set this at 22. See, I don't, it's going to be too big. Okay, let's make it 44 all the way around. And then I'll just scale it down until it matches the diameter of the bowl. How about there? Okay. We're doing old poly. Uh, U, C, X underscore bowl. I'm just called that bowl? No, it's still called T-Ball. Bowl. Okay, that should work. Okay, so this was Wimbayer. Wim... Wimbayer. So I'm gonna export that. We'll go in here. <clears throat> I believe I'm done with my... my system. I believe it works. Reimport. Should get a change. I hit play. Yeah, now it's now it's easier to actually hit it. The collision's better. Um click. We got a bowl of garlic. Yay, yay, yay. Okay, we got one. Let's uh let's see if we can get another one to work here. Um I did un 3DS Max. Oh, am I gonna have to? I'm gonna have to do this again. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna select, and I'm just gonna remove the garlic or remove the bowl and the thing. We'll delete the garlic. So, of all freaking things, 
Uh, I'm going to run into the same problem with the next mesh. Uh, so let me go back here and go to D. And I'm going to go to my uh, Mega Scans, download 3D food, edible, edible vegetable, this one. Can't bring it in. Oh, let's, let's try this one. Let's try eight. Oh, Jesus Christ. This stuff is so stupid. Can't, I can't, can't do that. Why, why are you so dumb? Okay, I'm going to have to do this the other way, which is bring in the highest res version of this thing. 3,000 polys for a freaking carrot, man. I'm dumb. Okay, I'm going to put this material on here, and I'm going to call it carrot. And we're going to go edit that material. Go up one. Edible two. All right. Okay. Uh, and there's a, a carrot. Who in their right freaking mind? Did he scans a carrot? Yes, these guys do. Yeah, see, that's going to be so small. This is this is one of those meshes, too, that if I put a whole bowl of carrots in here, uh, it's going to become very apparent. Yeah, it's, it's a really nice-looking carrot. Yeah, but it's a scan, right? It's I mean, it's it's going to look that good. Um, I could probably retopologize it and uh, and get something pretty decent looking. Um, okay, I don't I don't know that I'm going to do the carrot. Move on. Let's. Uh, I got to go through my list here and see what's next. So, uh, non blueprints, not this. I'm going to gather cabin in the woods, documents and totems. Go to Music Excel. Okay, let's go see what I can make in a very short amount of time. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, no, 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 the balloon. I can do a balloon. Okay. Unhide all. And delete. Oh, wait. I still have my UI stuff that I've got here. Guys. Hide selection. We'll come back to those. I'm going to delete this. Like this stupid carrot. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, I have a uh, balloon to make. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, one of the creatures in the, uh, the game that I'm making is a killer clown. And I thought, what better to make than a balloon, a la um, it, you know. Hi, Georgie. Come play, Georgie. I thought that would be really good. That would freak people out to just see a balloon drifting in the middle of the world. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to animate this, though. I'm, I want to animate it, that's for sure. Maybe I, I, I can animate it. I can do that. Uh, okay. Um, I know how to animate it. I got something I can do, Georgie. Okay, so I'm actually just looking reference, uh, looking at reference of the it balloon, uh, and it's because it's actually kind of comic in in how not balloon like it is, um, and that it like it's got this crazy crazy oversized nub on it. the The mouthpiece on it is really oversized. And uh, and that's that's kind of hilarious. Uh, I love also that it's not on string, but it's on a piece of silk or uh, or uh, plastic tie. Uh, and so anyway, this is my uh, this is my goal is to uh, to make this. So uh, it does look rather completely spherical with only just the uh, the nub at the end. 
But I don't think that's going to read. I mean, I know that's that's kind of what it looks like in the movie. Um, eh, there's a little bit of a pull at the bottom. Good, too. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to keep that open. Uh, just kind of looking at it for uh, for reference here for the size of this thing. And uh, let's convert this to an edible poly. Thousand polys. I'm already kind of where I want to be. Let's go to the front view. And uh, I want to... Uh, let's see. Let's do soft selection. Vertices. Soft selection. And let's grab the very bottom. And pull it down. That may not have been enough. I'm going to pull it up. A little more. A little more. Maybe even a little more, Georgie. I think that'll work. Pull this down. About here. There. There. Okay. We've got something very balloon shaped now i'm gonna put the uh the little nub at the bottom you're down you all right they float down here they all float down here let's go and do this uh well, let's start with a tube i'm gonna do this in the top view here I can get the I want to make that oversized piece because I think it uh it looks better being oversized. It makes it almost more like a, a caricature of a balloon instead of actually being a balloon. Okay, so I didn't count how many edges I put on this thing. That might be important. Ooh, I still have that on. Uh so I have thirty-two. So on this guy, we'll also make 32. That way they'll line up, and I should be able to uh, make two things out of that. Hey, Raina, how you doing? The impression, lol, I went to get a drink and came back downstairs, and all I heard was you doing it. <laughs> Hi, Georgie. I do that to my kids, try and freak them out. They've never seen it. And so it's lost on them, but my, my wife goes pale. <laughs> Actually, my kids have heard of it um, from other kids at school. I guess like one kid has an older brother who saw it, and, and he scares his younger brother with it. And the younger brother goes to school and tells all the other kids that don't have older siblings, oh my god, killer clown. And, uh, and so the kids are like, Pennywise, Pennywise, oh my god. And and when I when I did that, I did that at the dinner table once. I was like, hey, Georgie, you want to go play outside? And my kids both, like, lost their minds. And uh, I was like, how did... You don't know what it is? What are you talking about? Um, but, yeah. His, his take on Pennywise is absolutely brilliant. The... Um, I don't know if you've seen... The uh, the original TV um, version of this that had come out, but it was uh, it was a very different take that was done originally. Uh, in that, uh, and Tim Curry had done it, and I Tim Curry's was was disturbing in its own way, but uh, but I think they they made the mark the smart decision in uh, in in really reinventing Pennywise when they did that. Um, that movie it was, uh, it was a good way to go because they ended up with something that is, uh, unique and not, uh, not just a, a read, a redo. If you are interested, if you didn't know this already, um, they are redoing another Stephen King in the same way, uh, from way back when The Stand, uh, which was another one that like it was a made for TV movie. Um, and it's it's a great story and end of the world kind of uh, apocalypse story. 
and uh and they're re they're redoing that which will be absolutely brilliant uh to see that done uh, my wife's against it because she really loves the uh she really loves the original one but part of that is you know she remembers it from her uh she remembers it from her childhood uh from being a teenager and watching it you know it was one of the first like uh adulty kind of things you watch as a teenager so i got my little nozzle on the end of this here we're gonna go and uh let's give this a single poly group and uh as with all good meshes, ZBrush we go. I'm gonna bring this into ZBrush. And uh, draw it on the canvas and go edit. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna remesh it in ZBrush and uh, bring off Max. Uh, I'm going to remesh it in ZBrush because there's a few things that I need to change about the shape. And so I'm going to do a couple of things here. First, I'm going to go to Geo and we're going to crease the polygroups and then subdivide this. And what that's going to do is it's going to hold the shape on these different colors. Uh, and then I'm going to uncrease all. I just did it four times here, but we'll uncrease all and subdivide a couple more times. And you can see that'll soften the transitions between things so it already looks a little bit more balloony which is nice uh and then i'm going to delete my subdivision levels i'm at two million polys and uh i think the other thing that i'm going to want to do with this so this broke me the last time i tried to do this somewhere else let me unify the balloon and then i'll go to geo this has made the balloon really really small and uh we're going to dynamesh this sucker and I'll leave it at 128. We'll see what that looks like. It'll do. That's not enough. Let's double it. Well, that's not double. Let's go four times. Four times is better. Okay. So, now that I have this um, set up, let's go and sculpt a little down here. They float down here. They all float down here. So I'm going to go and actually let's do just a very small mask and try and blur it out. Yeah. And then what I'm going to do is switch to my move tool, center this sucker, and scale it in. And I'm hoping I have to come down to put it back here. That'll give me the impression of it being tied. And uh, we're going to dynamesh it again. We'll switch over to the clay tubes brush. And I'll start going in some wrinkling as the rubber gets pulled into the knot. Let's smooth it on this. Even try and soften this edge here a little bit too. There actually is a nozzle type thing on the balloon, so it's not going to be perfect. But I'll get it kind of just a little closer. Okay. That's reading quite nicely. And I want to be very careful when I do this that uh, I don't want to, like, I don't want to accidentally sculpt or anything on the top of the balloon. If I lose any of that rounded shape, this is this is all for naught. It's not going to read. Um, so the other thing I need to do is pucker up the inside here. So we're going to start by filling in this hole that's here. And I'll do another remesh and soften that. It needs to be closed in here. And then uh, I want to make sure that there is a lip around this guy. That's not working. We're going to use inflate. What is this we're looking at? I got a comment from Twitch. Um, who wahoo? Uh, what you're looking at, wahoo, is a uh, is a balloon. 
And uh, the reason I'm making a balloon, this is a, uh, I teach a character class and uh, I will be teaching it in the fall. And what I'm making is a game for my students to play um, for when they do the character class to determine what character they're going to make for the year. And so the point of the balloon, I don't, uh, I don't just let students pick at random who they're going to be. Uh, I want to give them a little bit of guidelines and give them a theme and something uh, to aim for in terms of you know visual quality and that kind of thing. And so what I typically do is create um, uh, either DLC for a game that already exists, or in this case, we're going to kind of just make believe that there is uh, a game that we're going to be building on. And uh, and in this case, what we're doing is going to be uh, making monsters, making creatures, and a survivor. So I've decided each student is going to make one male character, one female character, and it's going to be a uh, a male survivor or female survivor, whatever your choice. And uh, the other character then has to be the uh, the opposing gender. So you get two characters. One has to be a survivor, one has to be a monster, and um, it's up to you which is which. And so um, the, way that the, uh, the way that the system's going to work, if you're new to the stream and you haven't seen this before, I've been putting this together in Unreal. And what I've got here is a, uh, an old basement. And uh, right now it's, it's still a little on the empty side. I've still got a lot of... Uh, I still got a lot of uh, a lot of things to put in here, but the idea is that it's going to be kind of this old rundown basement that uh, the students are going to spawn randomly in this basement, and uh, and when they spawn, I can kind of show you what this looks like, how this is going to work. So when they spawn, and they're not going to be given instructions, they're just going to be told to play this. So they'll spawn, and uh, they'll be given the option to kind of walk around in the world and whatnot and uh and kind of explore and hidden throughout the world on shelves and on the floor and pinned to the wall and all over the place um are going to be totems 50 different items and each item relates to a different creature or monster and uh and when you pick up that item that will lock in who you are for what monster you're doing for this semester so without any instruction the students won't know what picking up an item does so for instance the one that i just got working over here um if i go walk over you can see there's an object on the on the on the shelf here and when i look at it and click the button we can see that this is a bowl of garlic and it says you recognize the smell of this guy as soon as you pick it up it smells like your grandmother's cooking. Oh, there's an apostrophe missing. Actually, it smells like your grandmother too. I don't think anyone will be eating this one. It's as hard as a rock. And so then you get the option to either take the object or put the object back. If you choose to take the object, this will then solidify what creature you're doing. So in the case of the garlic here, you'd be working on a vampire. When you put it back, it goes back on the shelf and you're free to go walk around and find something else. And so, oh, was there a garlic typo? Damn it, Galric. <laughs> wow, thank you for pointing that out, Galric. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, okay, let me go and uh, fix that. I believe it's coming from my data struct here. Uh, where are you, Empire? Empire is 19. There he is there. Garlic. <laughs> Garlic. Uh, and actually, the apostrophe with mothers. Grandmother. Grandmother. R apostrophe. Oh, that's not an apostrophe. Try that again. There we go. So I'll save this, and uh, and anyway, that should uh, that should work. Who doesn't love a good Galric bread? So yeah, so as you wander around, kind of aimlessly in this place, you'll come across these guys. There we go. Now it's not Galric, uh, and uh, hopefully fixed. Damn it, the apostrophe is missing. Still, uh, I might be pulling that from somewhere else then. I could have sworn I was using the data struct for that. 
Uh, let's go into... Oh, and I couldn't spell struct either. If it... This is what happens when your fingers move faster than your brain. Uh, those guys are fine. That's just the structure. The totem. So, uh, 19. 19. Garlic, garlic, vampire, vampire. You were going to do a bit of grandmother's cooking. Actually, it smells like your grandmother, too. Okay, so that was saved. Why did it not get pulled back up into the... Let's go to my blueprint. Where's my... Huh? My widget blueprint. Oh, I put it in this, right? Uh, interaction. No, you're not in here. But yes, anyway, that's what that's for. Uh, the balloon is, uh, is going to be one of the other totems that you pick up. Uh, in this case, it won't be a vampire, but it'll be a, uh, a killer clown. So if you, if you pick up the balloon, that's what you're going to be doing. Um, and the reason I jumped into doing the balloon, obviously there's a lot more modeling and texturing and stuff that's going to happen in this world. Um, but the reason I jumped into doing the balloon is that I'm testing to see if this system works. And currently there's a, the garlic is the only model that I've got that's in here, um, for my totems. All the other totems are just a teapot for now. And so I need, I need to swap something out. And so I figured I'd, uh, I'd do the killer clown, um, and I can put that, that totem somewhere and see if it works. Um, okay, so let me go into here, and blueprints, and widget, and examine, and let's make sure, and in description here, I'm just description for UMG. Uh, so we are on Earth. Is that getting mixed up on examine? Bar description. Let's go find references to this. Set. So this looks like it should be working. I am getting I'm getting this from my data table. Uh, maybe what I'll do is switch from garlic to anything else and run it again. Uh, now I lost my garlic. It's over here. And then we'll switch it back to garlic and run it again. Just so it kind of refreshes, if that's a thing. Uh, there, yeah, now the apostrophe's there. So I don't know why it was doing that, but it, uh, it wasn't updating the, uh, the spelling. I've got to fix the FOV here, too. Uh, I like the blurred out background, but, um, it's, I'm actually blurring the garlic here, too, which I don't want. And so, we'll have to fix that. But anyway, that's what the, uh, that's what the balloon is for. Um, right now I'm just kind of, uh, making it look balloon-like. We'll turn the Dynamesh off, and uh, now that I'm kind of happy with the shape, somewhat happy. It feels a little funky in here. Anyway, um, I'm going to go and Z-Remesh this. So the first thing I'm going to do is duplicate it so I have an original shape to get back if I need to. And then in Geometry, we're going to go to Z-Remesher. Uh, I'm going to turn the target polygon counts down and Z-Remesh it. Actually, point 0.1 is going to be stupid low poly. Uh, I could probably do a couple hundred polygons in this, maybe 500, 600 polygons. Like, it's just a sphere. Um, but the, the silhouette of it, making sure that it's round and that you can see that roundness um, across the entirety of the, uh, the room will be important. Um, and then I'm going to need to make the rubber material read on this correctly as well. So... It appears the ZBrush just shit the bed. 
I'm not entirely sure what's happened here. Oh, there it goes. This is not an overly complex shape, and it's only a 500,000 poly, so I can't imagine why it would struggle in this way. Wow, that's beautiful. Glad I waited all this time. <laughs> Stupid software. Let's set this to... Uh, this number is in thousands, yeah? Yeah, it's in thousands. So let's set it to 1,000. And remesh it. Now, I'm enclosing this mesh <clears throat> so that I have uh, the ability to texture it in a pretty cool way. There's uh, an idea I've got. So that it doesn't really need a lot in terms of, uh, in terms of UVs. Uh, oh, bad, but it's not good either. Um... I'm going to go to transform and I'm going to turn on my radial symmetry and we'll set it to, are you, why, why, because I need it to, let's do 1.25, what, you remesh, oh, right here, uh, 1.25, back to, so let's, uh, let's see if this does a better job, I'm going to amp, amp up the amount of polygons a little bit, and with the radial symmetry on, it should give me uh, a much rounder shape because the retopology should be radial symmetry as well. Oh, son of a... Or not. Okay, let's never do that again. Okay. Let's see what this does. So this will be about a 30 second texture job inside of uh, inside of uh, ZBrush, or not ZBrush, inside of uh, Substance Painter. I've got an idea how to do this. Um, when I made my list, there we go. It's balloon enough. Um, when I made my list of, uh, of things that uh, needed texturing, so I'm just subdividing it here again to get back up to a couple million. And the reason for that is that I want the shape back. So subtool, project, and project all. Uh, when I was coming up with the list of totems and the list of creatures that I was going to be doing for this class, um, the clown was the second one that I thought of. Um, and, uh, and the reason the clown was the second one that I thought of is that just it's I don't know. It's a very creepy thing. It's a very iconic thing. It's a very uh, easy thing to kind of do. Um, and it would be a fun assignment for a student, I think, to uh, to do a clown. So there's my high poly. Uh, now you're going to see the artifacting here from these the dynameshes here. Uh, but it's actually artificial. It's not actually low poly like that. So... I'm just going to run the smooth brush over this a little bit to clean that up because it's not actually there. And that'll uh, that'll really mess with what I'm about to do. Let me drop down a subdivision here and smooth it just so that I'm getting it really nice and smooth. And I'm not overly concerned about the rest of this thing. It's got a nipple. Let's get rid of that. And we'll go up a subdivision level. Not that it matters. Balloons typically will have that same little pinch point at the top. So it's actually a little accurate having that there. Okay, so we have this like this. So let's go and delete the original one that I did. Now that it's no longer needed. And uh, I'm going to go down to my lowest subdivision level on this. And I'm going to go to Z plugins. UV master and unwrap this sucker. And then we're going to go down to normal map and flip the green channel and create a normal map for this. 
Actually, I'm not going to bother with that. Okay, let's export this. It's got UVs, so let's go and put it in the right place here. Cabin in the woods. Uh, this is going to be OBJ because I'm working on it, and this is... Balloon. Then, we'll go to the highest subdivision level. Export again. Balloon underscore high. And we'll let that spit out. While that's being spit out, we're going to go into max. We'll delete, delete the original one and import the balloon that I just made. So, oh, nowhere near the right place. That's not the right place. Projects. Cabin in the Woods, OBJ, Balloon. So I just want to see what the UVs look like on this here before I do anything to it. Um, we're going to get rid of the uh, mass effects. Uh, so let's go open the UV editor here and see what it's got. This is kind of pretty typical of what I was expecting it to look like. Um... I guess that's going to be fine. So the only thing that I really want to watch out for um, is that I want to make sure I'm going to rotate it sideways a little bit here and scale it down and bring it down. So if you notice, I have um, about half the UV space taken, um, which is what the, that's kind of what I'm interested in seeing is that uh, I end up with that. Uh, ideally, I would not want to have seams in that kind of design. It would be nicer if the seams were just straight down one side and up the other, um, which maybe I can go and do that here. So if I were to go maybe down here and remove one half of this, make this some other color, back your balloon I'm just gonna see where that ends up at the bottom yeah so it's not actually hitting the nipple but it's it's getting there so if I were to go and break that I think that'll give me a better better edge I'm trying to hit shortcuts from Maya here and like, why are they not working boom uh, this okay <sighs> let's just go into Maya trying to use tools from Maya in Max don't work uh, did this finish this finished hooray let's delete the balloon and file import uh, balloon high. So the only reason I'm bringing it in here is just to make sure that my name is correct. I don't even have to do that. Cancel. Only one model. I don't need to underscore high, underscore low. Come on, you. Okay. So let's go do better UVs on this. So the reason I want to set up my UVs in a very particular way is that I'm going to put a string on this thing. And, uh, and I've got plans for that string. Okay. So cabin in the woods, OBJ. Balloon, uh, balloon, just balloon, balloon, just this one. Okay, zoom in. Oh yeah, I forgot he's tiny. Uh, I forgot that I had done that. Why am I locked out of Maya? What's going on? Why is Maya giving me lag? Is it not fully loaded? Yeah, no, fully, fully going. Hell, man. Never had lag like this inside of Maya. Uh, okay. Well, now it's not lagging. Now I've got the UV editor open. Uh, let's do this in a better way. Uh, so I'm going to start here and bridge that. And bridge that. And let's see what happens if I just open this up. Are you a symmetry on? Asymmetry. Trying to bring this up to the 
pop here. Open it up. That should give me much better UVs. Much better UVs. Okay, so we're gonna rotate this thing around. Uh, let's not do that. This. And again, I wanna kinda get it. Okay, I'll do it like that, and that'll give me the top here for the string. Uh, I just want to go take a look at the seams on the bottom here. Because it looks like it's not what I want. Indeed, it goes around the thing. Okay, so this edge needs to weld up. And this hole, weld up. And we're going to go in here. And around here. Okay, let's re-unwrap this. Oh, that, I broke it. Didn't mean to break the piece off. I guess we can go and put this and this and this back. There. Okay, much better UVs. Let's go lay this out. And that'll work. Okay, so I've got something that'll uh, that'll give me some decent UVs now. We're just going to export this again. Uh, export selection. FBX, export selection. We're going to go to desktop, projects, cabin in the woods. I'm going to go to FBX and totem meshes. And I might as well already write this over. Killer clown. H-I-J, killer clown. Okay. We'll overwrite that. Uh, actually, while I'm at it here, there's no smooth groups on this. Let's fix that while we're here. Mesh display, soften edges. And, uh, object mode off. Looks good. Okay. File. Export. Selection. FBX. For the clown. All right, so with that done, uh, I should be able to substance painter the heck out of this thing now and uh, get it working. So, to painter. Painter. Double click for the win. All right. Won't bother with a new one. Uh, I guess I do need to log in. No, I don't. Okay, new project. We're going to do 2K. Grab my balloon mesh, cabin in the woods, Fibix, Odoms, Killer Clown, and Okie Doke. And as long as my rotations didn't get screwed up by going inside of every possible software there is, um, this should work nicely. Nicely, Georgie. OBJ. Balloon high. Violation. Up. We're going to go uh, eight times anti-aliasing. Uh, ID map doesn't matter. Ambient occlusion all the way up. Thickness all the way up. Nothing else should matter. And nothing else matters. Now the waiting aim. As we allow the bake to proceed. It's got to first import the mesh. The first bake is always the longest. Um, and because it's got to bring that high poly into the software. But once the high poly's in and we see the... Uh, the world space normal maps start populating here. It'll be uh, it'll be not all that long. Uh, there isn't there we go. There isn't a lot of uh, information here to capture, right? Like there's a little bit of of detailing down at the bottom where the uh, the spout is, but it's it's basically just a big round object. The map that I'm actually most interested in here is the thickness map. Um, I'm hoping to get a very useful bit of information out of that thickness map, and we're gonna see. What it gives me, ooh, boy, that curvature map was ugly. 
Okay, here's the thickness map. So I'm hoping to get darker values down in the bottom uh, of, of the balloon here. So really big bright whites areas up here. Yeah, and good. Thicker down there. So good. Yay! It did what I wanted it to do. So uh, I'm going to go over to my material here. We're going to delete that. We're going to go to materials. I'll just grab the plastic gloss. And uh, I can now actually start making this thing look balloon-like. Um, so it needs to be shiny, but not this shiny. Uh, it is rubber after all. So that's a little bit better color for it or uh, reflectivity for it. Uh, we're going to go red. And the it red isn't exactly uh, a brilliant red like this. Uh, it's actually almost even a purple in color. It's more a little bit there uh, and darker. And so something like that. It's almost, you know what it is, is it's almost blood red. Um, if I were to darken this a little bit, we'd get something that looks a little bit more bloody. Okay, uh, so that's good like that. And, uh, and done. That's the only thing I want to do in Substance Painter. So I'm going to go and export my textures, uh, which uh, really is not going to give me a hell of a lot. Uh, the only things that I'm really interested in here, uh, in fact, I don't even need this red color. Um, I don't even need to export my textures. It's really just my bakes that I'm interested in here. So I'm going to, I'm going to spit out two maps. I'm going to spit out the thickness map. Uh, let's go to the textures here. Textures. So there's the thickness map. We're going to go and export this. Export. Where'd you go? Export resource. And uh, let's go put this. So here's Cabin in the Woods. And uh, we're going to go to textures. And I'm going to make a new folder called balloon. And in here, we'll select it. So that's in there. And the normal map as well is going to export. And we're going to go projects, Cabin in the Woods, textures, balloon, and export. Okay. So let's now, um, why are you flashing? Let's go and bring this sucker into Unreal. So in Unreal, if I go to my meshes, it's not my meshes, my totems, and I go find the killer clown, which is this guy, what I'm going to do is just right click and re-import. It's going to tell me there's a material change. Oh, and it's going to tell me my balloon is tiny. The right. I have to refix that in 3DS Max. So that's what I need Max for. Where's my grid? Perspective. File. Import. So I'm going to bring the balloon in. Uh, Kevin in the Woods. FBX. Totem Meshes. Killer Clown, or Killer Clown. This is going to be really, really tiny. It's going to be like a penny. And I'm going to import any of the other ones. And uh, the reason I'm import importing the other ones is that it is a uh, it's a use for scale here because I've got them I've got them at the right size. So we'll scale up the balloon. until it matches about the size that I want. Its pivot point has to be at the origin here, so that's that's gonna work out well. I'm gonna delete the teapot now. Um, the balloon needs collision as well. So let's go rename this balloon. Uh, and I shouldn't have to do anything else with it other than make the, uh, the rope. So I'm gonna make the rope and I'm gonna dangle it down. It's gonna be below the collision. So I'm going to do this with a spline. I'll do it in my front view. And we're going to start off by having it wrap around here. And then I'm going to bring it down maybe that far. The next thing I'm going to do is go into the vertices on this thing. Set them to Bezier corner. And I'm going to give the string a little bit of a wobble. So that's my front view. I'm going to go into the right view, and I'll give it a little bit of a wobble. And the only reason I do that is that from every angle now, you're going to see that the string isn't straight. Oh, except for that view. Move it a little bit that way, too. Whoa, too much. Too much. Much too much. Anyway, I'll be able to fix that, too. Uh, now, 
up in here. We're going to go grab this guy. And we're going to hit refine. Put a point. Drag the point over. And I'll move this point. From above here, I'm going to move this point back. We're going to make this a Bezier corner as well. We're going to refine again here. Put this on this side. Refine again here. Put this on this side. And I'll now have all of the nodes I need to go around this thing. I'm just going to set them all to be smooth and bring them in. You're not smooth. Smooth. Man. Let's smooth out this one. Well. Something like that. Um, I'm going to get a little bit of clipping through here, but that's okay. It's not going to be the end of the world. We're dealing with things that are in centimeters in scale here, so if it's not perfect, I, I don't care at this point. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is go to rendering, render this as a rectangle in the viewport, and then go play with my numbers here uh, until I get rendering the way that I wanted to render. So two centimeters is too big. We're going to bring it down. Let's try a centimeter. That's going to work out nicely. I'm going to go into my interpolation, and I'm going to bring this number up to 24 because I want enough vertices down the spline. That's going to break the shit out of the one up here, but I don't worry about that. I'm going to convert to edible poly, and we are going to bring these things. Let's isolate this for now. So what I'm going to do is detach the bottom stuff. Oh, and that's what just occurred to me. I have way more polygons here than I think I do. So there's polygons on all sides of this. Um, and that happened because this is a box. It's not a card. Even though I made it look like a card, it's not a card. So I got to go that this move that instead of three. I have two. I'm missing missing that one. Three. Three. Delete. Okay. So the reason I went and deleted those is that now in polygon mode I can grab this and if I can get angle correct I can shift click and delete and I got rid of half the polygons and the thickness should be gone there should only be ah oh, damn it it did not do what I wanted it to do um no that was right that again three three in here there is three I'm gonna hit this one come back here shift click that one and invert and delete there we go okay so now that i got this a little bit more manageable i'm going to take all of the stuff that is the ribbon part of this and i'm going to detach it momentarily oh screw you max Detach. okay then i'm going to go up here and i'm going to dot ring this thing so i'm going to start here dot ring Make sure I have nothing up here selected, nothing down here selected, and remove this one, dot ring, this one, dot ring, and there. Now we can attach this again, and just seal up the holes. So what I'm doing here, um, it may be hard to follow what's going on. This is going to be my rope, and I'm trying to set it up in a very exact way um, that I'll be able to do something in the engine that is going to look, I'm hoping, good. 
Uh, I wouldn't want it to not look good. Move this over. This guy over. So what I'm going to do with this is, um, because of the way that I've got these meshes set up, I don't have uh, any kind of uh, animation. I can't use skeletal meshes. And so I need to do my animation in another way. Um, oh, that's vertex number two. Okay, whatever, put that there. Uh, I just realized that there was a broken part here. I can't have a triangle on this. It'll break what I'm doing. Where's my cut tool? There you are. So I'm going to cut an edge in here. And I'm going to flip the normals on this because, well, they don't really matter. I'm going to make it two-sided. I'd rather not have the outside normal around the balloon. We're just going to go and flip this, convert it to an editable poly. We're going to bring back the balloon. And if I can, wouldn't be a terrible idea to try and get these guys on the outside of the balloon. If I can. Again, it's not the end of the world if they're not, but uh, you will notice a little bit of white disappearing here when I make the rope white. Pull this guy out this way. Okay, good enough. So that should read correctly as a white rope on a balloon and i don't want to have it just stay static like this um as this like s-shaped curve because that's not going to work really really well so i've got a trick that i'm going to do here so i'm going to go and unwrap these two things together because i only I only want one material for this i don't want uh duplicate materials or double materials so we're going to go remove the balloon here so that i just have this guy the rope and uh i want to make sure there's no hole in it Let's go and relax it a bunch. And it seems to relax okay, so I think we're okay here. So I'm going to rotate it sideways. We're going to do a relax like this. Okay, then I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. And I'm going to bring it in here and scale it down. And I want it to just fill up the width of the UV box here. Something like that. It doesn't have to go exactly to the edges as long as it's not going past them. That'll work. Make sure this side, that side's good enough. Um, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring the UVs up. Again, I don't, I want, I don't want to go all the way to the top. And I'm going to bring the UVs down. I don't want to go all the way to the bottom. And then we're going to uh, convert this to an edible poly. Okay, so now there's UVs on the string. And more important to the UVs is my animation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a modifier on this called Vertex Paint. And we're going to display the vertex colors, which, which by default are white in here. So I'm going to fill them in black. And then I'm going to change my color to red and make sure that it's 5500. And I'm going to grab halfway up the string uh, in vertices, halfway up the string, and fill those with red. Then I'm going to hit the blur tool and smudge this until I see what looks like dark red at the top. So something like that. And you can see that there is like a very, very dark red there. So there, vertex color done. I'm gonna go back to my original color and convert that to an edible poly. The other thing I need to do is, if you remember, the default color of vertex color in uh, in Max here is is white, not black. That means the balloon in its vertex color, vertex V, vertex paint is white, and it shouldn't be. It should be black. I'm just gonna fill it with black. Back to the color, rotatable poly, and make sure this is called balloon. I can call this string, though that doesn't matter. And now we're going to reset the X form and export selection. So let's see about getting this to work now inside the engine. So we're going to A, reset the uh, FBX in an Unreal. I'll re import that and we'll reset it to the fbx 
I'm going to bring this in, and we should have something that is balloon sized, which looks like this. I want to make sure it's at about the dude's head or chest level. Yeah, that's that's about perfect. So good. That's what I want. Uh, while I'm texturing, I'm going to leave it in here. Next, I'm going to go to my textures and materials. I'm going to make a new folder and I'll call it balloon. Inside balloon, I'm going to import the only two textures that matter. Cabin in the Woods, Textures, Balloon. I'm going to go and rename these guys. This is going to be um, uh, balloon underscore n for normal. And this one is going to be balloon underscore uh, t for thick. And we'll import the two of these. Next, we'll go and create a material. And I am a material girl. Uh, M.A. for master material. I didn't do that. M.A. Underscore uh, balloon. And enter this. This is going to be a, um, a subsurface material. So we're going to go subsurface. And I'll dock this up here. And we're going to grab our two textures. And bring them in. And then just to make my life a little bit simpler here while I'm working, I'm going to go into my meshes and grab the balloon. Uh, followed by gear and teapot so that I can see the balloon while I'm working on it. So out of the gate, it's showing me um, the, the two different colors that are on here. Uh, it just occurred to me that that probably means I have two material IDs on this thing, which I should double check. I do. Shit sticks. Okay. Re-export again. Uh, wrong one. So, this. We'll just assign balloon. Grab this. File. Export selected. And killer clown. And then back to Unreal. Re-import, and again, uh, reset this to the FBX. Now it's all white, what I want. Okay, so first is the normal map, which should give me my little bits of nippling here down at the bottom, which looks okay. Uh, turn the grid on for this. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the, uh, the red color that I want. So this is going to go to the base color, and... We're also going to create a color that I'm going to multiply by the thickness map and place that into the subsurface color. So let's first deal with the balloon color, um, which is going to be mostly red with a little bit of blue. That's too much blue. Okay. That's pretty close to the right color. Uh, move that up. Uh, metallic value, I don't have to enter. I'm going to put a roughness level in, um, just so that I can make the balloon as shiny or not shiny as I want. I think somewhere like there is going to work. Uh, in terms of the color, I'm actually going to multiply my thickness map by the balloon color in hopes to get a darker color down at the bottom where the rubber is not stretched out as much. So something like that, I think looks pretty decent. And then inside of the, um, the value up here, for the subsurface color, I'm gonna start with making this really red. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of blue to it much still too much there's very little blue in that color okay that's step number one 
Now, this is obviously uh, painting the rope as well, which is not something that I want. But that's okay. I've got another texture that I need to create, and I'm going to create that on the uh, this map here. So first, I'm going to go to Max, and with these two things selected, actually, I just need the rope. I'm going to go and do Tools, Render UVW Template. I'm going to do this at 2048 by 2048. Like so, this is going to be a solid map, so that it's all one color. That color will be white. We're going to not show overlap, and I don't care about the seams or the edges. And there, I've got a mask for the rope, and I'm just going to copy that to the clipboard and head over to Photoshop. And in Photoshop, we're going to open up the balloon underscore T. So textures, balloon underscore T. Okay, and I'm going to go to the channels, and in the green channel, I'll paste it, and then I'll save it. Okay, next, Unreal, Textures, Balloon, I'm going to re-import this guy. I'm going to go into its values and make sure the RGB is turned off, and we're going to... Oh, that should be fine. Next, make sure this is linear color, which it is. I'm going to swap this to the red input, which is the thickness input again. So now my green is my mask for the ribbon. So the next thing I'm going to do is create another free vector, which I'll make white. I'm going to move this up here, and I'm going to create a lerp. And the lerp is going to be between white and balloon color, with green being the difference. And I did it backwards. Rope. Balloon. Okay. So now we've got a rope. We're going to make sure that this is a two-sided material, so that we see that rope from every angle. Except for that one. I could have actually twisted the geometry so that it's visible here too. May go back and do that. Uh, but anyway, let's look at the balloon here. And uh, we've got that. Uh, I want to also adjust the subsurface. I don't want any subsurface on this guy. So I'm going to take the green channel and do a 1 minus on it. And multiply that by the subsurface. So 1 minus just inverted the black and white image which made the rope black and the balloon white. And so when I multiply it by that, it just eliminates the rope from the subsurface. So we don't get any, uh, any weird color effects on that. So far, so good. There's one more thing I want to do. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to create a simple grass wind. In the simple grass wind, I'm going to create an intensity node a wind weight node, and a uh, world position offset, which goes in here. This is going to get multiplied by the green channel. No, that's a lie. It's going to get multiplied by the vertex color. And I just want the red channel. And I'll plug that into world position offset. And we'll bring that up. And now I gotta add some value to these numbers here. Let's try 0.25 and 0.25. Oh, much too much is too much. We're gonna save that. I don't think the vertex color gets added in here. So we're gonna go back here. Let's go to my totems, this guy, and balloon material, and go here. Okay, so it looks like <clears throat> the balloon is getting the vertex color, which means the vertex color did not get imported, um, which the reason for that happening is the... Uh, the fact that I, I re-imported the balloon instead of importing the balloon. 
So what I have to do, close this, is go to my totem meshes and hit import. Choose the balloon. Uh, Fibix totem killer. And here, I can now, oh. You really not gonna work? Okay, delete that. Delete that. Yes, yes. Ooh. Ooh, ooh. Wait. Cancel. Uh, that's not gonna work. Okay. I'm gonna rename this. And then I'm gonna import it. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, auto generate collision is fine. Fine meshes on. Import normals on. Where's my vert color? Vertex color on import. We want to uh, ignore vertex colors. Uh, place. There. Okay, import. And now I should be able to delete this one. And we're going to replace with this one. That should work. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I go in here, actually, I'll come back over here. You can just type in am I. Not M I M A underscore K uh, B. There we go. So now, just the string is moving and not the balloon. So now, what I can do is I can tweak that material, get the Movement correct. I'm going to add another node here for the speed. I'm going to slow the speed down to like a quarter. Okay. So now the test. Let's see if this system works. This is why I made the balloon in the first place. All of that work just to see if this system is going to do what I wanted to do. So. I take my child master blueprint, I put it in the middle of the room, I'm going to bring it up off the floor, and I need to now know the index value of my killer clown. So that is going to be in my blueprint folder under totems. So the killer clown is number two. So if I go and change this number to two, the balloon appears. Which means the system works. And I should be able to now go the right way. Oh, and... <laughs> One more thing I forgot. There's physics on these assets. So I'm going to have to turn the physics off on that. Uh, let's, let's do that, Georgie. Let's do that. I got to go find uh, this guy. Collision input uh, pickup mesh physics off and he shouldn't fall now and now we have a balloon so the whoa it has collision but I can walk through it that's not that's not right but if I click on it a balloon this perfect looking helium filled balloon was probably left behind, uh, was probably left, yeah, that's not English, I have to reread re this. This perfectly looking helium-filled balloon was probably left behind by some child, though what a child was doing in a place like this is another matter altogether. Come to think of it, why the balloon doesn't rise or sink is not sitting well with you. Yeah, it's going to be third person. The whole reason I wanted third person is to uh, be able to... I feel like I should move the... Ooh. 
I feel like I should move the balloon up a little bit. I think its pivot point is a little too high. Uh, but yeah, it's always going to be in third person. Nope, there's no first person. It's always going to be like this. So you can, when you interact with things, you get this interface where you can look at things. Um, but other than that, it's always going to be in third person. So that works fine. That means that my system now works. And that if I go over here, ah, oh, son of a bitch. Okay, so I obviously have to clear the temporary mesh whenever I instigate the, the system put back. So that was the other check that I needed to do. Um, so I've got a blueprint in the middle of the world called this BPLDA. Um, and it has a token number assigned to it. That token number comes from whatever mesh I interact with. However, see that's, I don't think that is subsurface enough for me. I feel like I should see more through the balloon. Um, this number needs to get reset whenever I exit the, uh, the system. So I need to go to the inventory system and find the exit from the system. Uh, event graph is empty. Instruction, assign mesh. No, it's in the player. So I need to go find my player blueprint. Blueprints, player blueprint. And it's going to be in here when we put shit back. There's my focal distance. I'm going to have to change the way this is working too. I think what I might do is get from the camera to the object and set it there. Anyway. Uh, okay. Game input, mouse input, mouse input, uh, mouse input. What is this? Freezes player, depth of field. So this is when you are uh, in the... That's when you're in the object in hand. And what do we got over here? Um, uh, nope. Drop the item in front of the player. Sorry, nope. Actually, I'm not, I'm not using this system at all. That's not in use. Uh, pick up items. Take item. Okay, so I'm going to have to do something with that. Throw item I'm not using. When using an item, okay, don't care about the throw. That's the UMG, that's the timer. They're moving. Click on item. Get enter act actor. Okay, so it's right here that I need to. Click on active item. I'm pretty sure it's right here where I'm going to in input this reset of the BPLDA. So let's do that. Let's get all actors of a class. That class is BPLDA. We are going to get this has to go here here and then we're going to clear that let's make this bigger Put these guys back okay and then we're going to get my var um not working why is that okay uh
var totem number set var totem number to zero but that that's not going to do what i want it's it's when i'm done looking at an object putting them back where it was after examining it that's where it goes I don't want to do it when I pick up the object. Oop. I want to do it back here. This should give me the interaction that I need. So this should clear whatever temporary variable variable is in the world. Okay, let's go check this out. That balloon, that bright red balloon stands out so much. Okay, balloon, healing field balloon, put back. Over here, and pick up the bowl. Garlic, ooh. Okay, so it worked, but it then didn't set this to be on interact is when I gotta set that number. So, uh, get all actors of class. That's mine. Where's my interact? Click on active item. Get interact actor. Here's the get interact actor. Find trace. Array. Break hit. Cast to interact base. Return node. Okay. Interact actor, blueprint, interact actor. Okay. That's not it. Back to my event graph. On interact. On interact is empty. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to work out the logic of where this is supposed to go. So let me go back to my main child master. Totem number is being set by me. How is it being set in the LDA? It's not being set in the LDA. It's just a variable, the default of zero. Okay, so on examine, get the description, that's for the UI, item names for the UI. Sign mesh. Sets that here. Signs the mesh. See, this should have overwritten it. So, this is the same blueprint that's on the garlic and on the balloon. Because this is one blueprint that is going to be all of the items. So, when you pick up the object, it's going to assign... First, assign the creature that you're going to be doing... Uh, an assigned creature and gets my data table, finds out what totem number I have set, finds that in the table, and then sets my variables. Then it assigns the mesh. And in signing the mesh, it takes that totem number that, again, I've assigned. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Assign mesh, assign creature. Totem number is this guy.
that's not the right variable. No, it is. That's how I'm assigning it. That's this guy. Totem number. I'm going to rename that, not totem number. Totem number selector. Keep track of it. And then var variable totem number is in the world. So I set the number of the thing in the world from here. Then we go in, in this case it's 19. It goes and finds number 19, which is down here somewhere, Werewolf Empire. And it goes and follows that, sets the mesh to be vampire, spits out, sets the totem name based on the object. Okay. So once that is set, then it's done with this and on examine, on event, no, on construction. Goes to the parent construction script. Okay. So the, the logic is sound. It's just not resetting that variable. Well, the second, the second mesh is not setting the variable. So when I have two blueprints in the world, this blueprint has a variable of two, and this blueprint has a variable of nine. What happens if I pick them up in the opposite order? Maybe I just broke the garlic, and that the logic still works. It is. Okay. This guy is just broken. I'm going to set that to zero. And now neither one of them should work. I think what happened is that the system is not actually working. I had just typed in the right number and made it work. It's not getting hit anymore. Okay. So that's what's going on. The system. On examine, sign mesh. This isn't actually doing what, it, what I thought it was doing. Make that not global, so I don't need it outside of here. Okay, so why is it not assigning that mesh anymore? Let's go to the other blueprint and see. The inventory blueprint is this one. Uh, get all actors of class. This is why. I'm not telling it what number. Um... Get that number, but I'm not. Oh, here I'm just getting the number. I'm not setting it. That's where things, so it's not actually doing what I think it's doing at all. So here I set the number to this value. Let's print the number out. Let's do that. Let's go here. Um, tick. Where's my tick? There's my tick. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to print on screen that, uh, actually, let's do this. Let's not do it in there. Let's do it in the level blueprint. In play, nothing else in here. Okay, so we'll create a tick. And on tick, uh, not you, we're going to... Let's just get a reference to this guy. Uh, 
get a reference to that. Get a uh, var totem number. And print that shit. Go to screen. Let's see what's going on. Okay, save. Play. So the number is zero. Wrong way. What? My balloon and my garlic are broken. Okay, it just reset everything to zero. My variable's gone. What the hell did I do? Pick up. Totem number. Set. Oh. That has to be global. Wait a minute. Totem number selector. Oh, yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Recompile this. This should now give me the ability to type in two and get the balloon. And 19. Get the garlic. Okay, play. So the default is 19, which means the balloon's going to be wrong. But when I click on the balloon, while I see the garlic, it should have here changed. Put back, and now it's zero. So the reset is working. If I pick up this guy, it doesn't go back to zero. Put back. If I pick up the balloon, Okay, so it's not being set on pickup. So it's in here that this is not actually doing what it's supposed to do. So get all actors of class, this thing. Uh, what is this thing? I'm getting... Uh, an array returns a temporary copy of the item in the array. Get out actors. Zero. There's only one of those things in the world, so zero should work. So that gets the one that's in the world. From there, we are setting the one that's in the world's totem number to the totem number selector, which by default is zero. So the totem number selector it's only ever using this value. So when they're in the world and I select them and I type this value in here, this value is not being read. Okay. So that is the issue. Is that this number allows me to change this mesh, but it's not being read in the blueprint here. This number only ever uses the value here. I hit play, it's at 19. No, it's at 2. Balloon. Play. 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 So it's reading the balloon. Why is it reading the balloon? Because that was the last one made. What if I delete the balloon? Is it reading 19? No, it's still reading 2. Where is it getting 2? Default value of this guy. Put him number. See, that works. Yep. Put him number. Sense. 
I'm going to try a for loop here. Because oop, I have a funny feeling. That there's something broken with that array. Okay, so now it's reading 19. So it did read the right object. So let's put a balloon back in. Where the hell am I? Okay. Uh, this. Garlic. That's fine. Uh, that's the wrong mesh. This one. Okay, and we'll go switch this to be the balloon. So now it reads the balloon, which has physics on it again. Yeah, fuck. Brr. <clears throat> it is not doing what it's supposed to do. Why is it not reading that number? I'm wondering if there's a common Oh, these are all my own variables. Where the hell? Why the hell is this not getting set? Auto number selector, global variable. Am I using that in here? Not. If I don't make this global, it should still work. Not being global means I don't get access to the number here. Which means I can't set it in the world. And I see if I can do this another way. What is this, an integer? This one's a byte. So let's promote this to a variable. Make this one global. Item number should allow me to now set it here. That works with a byte. Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> That's not doing anything. Put this back in here. This. can't set a variable that's in my LDA. Let's go to the LDA and make sure that variable is mobile. It is a byte. Okay. There's the default number. Go to value of zero. And it still reads two. Son of a bitch, why are you not working? I don't understand why it's not updating. Yeah, let's put a pause in here. Uh, no, 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 no. Pause in here and see if I can. Okay. So, break. Uh, uh, uh. No, this guy. Thanks. Break. Okay. See if the game ever stops. So that's very telling. Sign mesh is not being called. This is never firing off. Sign mesh. Oh, because I'm a. F I'm assigning the mesh in the construction script. Uh, and it shouldn't. It's got to go in the event graph. Or. Kind of a uh, that's why I'm gonna put it on an examine. Okay. That's what I'm doing wrong. I'm an idiot. Construction script. We can assign the the creature in the construction script, not the mesh. Assigning the mesh has to happen when we examine. So now it should work. Put a breakpoint on here. That was a stupid miss. Now those things are not correct anymore. Uh, item number two. Ah, yes. It has to be in both. Otherwise, I can't set it when I'm building. 
Uh, okay, so it has to go in the construction script as well. Sign match. Okay. There's my stop. It is being assigned, which is good. Remove breakpoint. Okay. So this should mean I'm not completely out of my mind. That we see garlic here. I did that. There's breakpoint. Uh, remove breakpoint. Uh, so again and we have garlic back the number switch back to zero and we have the balloon huzzah okay logic for the win okay Save. Oh, my sweet bejesus. That took more brain power than it should have. So that means that I can now place these items in here. They'll all work, provided when I bring in my pickup, I change the item number. Uh, and set it accordingly. So if I put another one over here, uh, whatever, I'll leave it as Alien Beast. I'll put another one over here. Let's go drag this up a little bit. No, up. Oh, 255. 49. Uh, that didn't update. Okay, so there is a new problem with this. Assign mesh, construction script, assign mesh. Uh, delete. No, where are you? Okay. Uh, totem item number selector. Select it. Item number. Where are you in use then? That's why the number's not doing anything. Because I went and did this. Nonsense. that As uh, selector item number is that the item number that's item number uh pick up this is open this is off There we go. Okay, there. And there. Okay, let me do a build. Play. 33. Okay, so I now have four different items in here. Five different items, four different items. Let's see if this works for all of them. The balloon is broken, and the garlic are broken. Uh, garlic, balloon. Also, the balloon doesn't get physics. Okay, so there should be four items in here. One, two, 
two, three, four. So we got garlic. You recognize the smell of this guy as soon as you pick it up. It smells like your grandmother's cooking. Actually, it smells like your grandmother, too. I don't think anyone will be eating this one. It's as hard as a rock. Put it back. The balloon. This perfect looking helium filled balloon was probably left. No, oh, we gotta fix that. Let's go into my blueprints and totems and killer clown. Are you killer clown? Killer clown. Oh, killer clowns too. Uh, was probably left behind. I can't. Why can't I? Oh, it's down here. Uh, left. And we just need a joy. That's right, Joyty. Okay. Uh, let me read this. This perfect looking helium filled balloon was probably left. Find. By some child. So, what a child was doing, a place like this. Doesn't matter altogether. Okay. Save. And that should work. So, let's go have a look here and see if these four things work the balloon, text. Yeah, weird. It doesn't update. I wonder why it does that. Anyway, we got a balloon. Let's put the balloon back. Go to the garlic. We got garlic. Let's put that back. Down here. I'm going to have to reread all my descriptions. Calendar. All right, Bray. Let's see how good you are. This item is going to be a calendar. The description of which says, Looks like this is your typical run-of-the-mill Georgian calendar. The date says 1980 and the day is circled. Looks like May 9th. I'm not sure what is so important about it. What movie monster is this? What... Creature is going to be done when you pull up this item. Anybody? Yeah, who is it? So it would probably help if I told you what the mesh was going to be, which is pretty much exactly what it describes. It's going to be a 1980 calendar. And, uh, it is going to be open to May, and uh, the May page will be torn a little bit, um, but May 9th will have a red circle on it, and through the tear, we're also going to see that June 13th is circled, even though that's not described here. What do you got? You give up? So on May 9th of 1980, that was the release date of a movie whose date appears the next month in June. Yeah, it's Jason. That's the release of the very first Friday the 13th movie. And the movie came out on May 9th, but June 13th, the very next month, was a Friday the 13th. And so the movie was in theaters over Friday the 13th. And so this is going to be a calendar uh, where you're going to see May 9th, the release date of the movie, circled. But the tear in the, uh, the, tear in the page of May is going to show you the Friday the 13th underneath. Also, I'm thinking that the picture for the top half of the calendar 
is going to be a uh, a kid playing street street hockey, and I'll put the like the old school Freddy Jason mask on him or something. Try and make it not very obvious. Anyway, let's put that back. Let's see if you can guess the monster for the next one. If I can look at it. There it is. There. Oh, Crystal Lake sign. That'd be good. That'd be good. How about this one? Nail clippers. This rusty old nail clipper is standard in its design in all areas but one. Scale. It's near five times larger than a typical pair of clippers. What being would need anything this large? Any ideas? No, that one's it's it's actually <laughs> not as interesting. It's just a giant. It's a giant, just a giant. I'm gonna have somebody doing a giant. Uh, okay. So the one last thing that I want to go and edit. Totems. No, that's my meshes. The balloon. I'm not happy with the uh, level of subsurface. Uh, that I'm getting from this. It's not actually, uh, uh, not actually as subsurface as I like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a value into my opacity, and this is going to control how subsurface the object is. And so you can see I'm getting a light spot here now. If I bring this up to one, we get a little bit less. And so I think I'm going to leave it at zero. We'll leave it as as subsurface as possible. And we'll see what that does to it in the world. So it's definitely better. It's definitely starting, like, I can actually see the uh, the breadth of the translucency to it. This might just be one of those items that I'm going to have to very carefully place in order to get it to read the right way. I could also let's throw some emissive on this. I gotta darken the emissive down. I'm not gonna want it to glow. Glow. Yes. Yeah, so just enough um Let's multiply this. Put it in the emissive. And I'll multiply it by, I don't know, 0.1. Just enough so that the shadow isn't black, I think. There. Might be even able to go up a little bit more. So now, no matter what, you're not going to get blacks on the balloon. Yeah, I know, absolutely. If I go and do, uh, I can even do it as a decal on the ground. Just have it actually attached to something like that. But let, me, uh, let me go full screen here. I want to see what, the, yeah, the balloon looks way better now. I'm going to spin the, the rope, too. I don't like how flat it is from one side. I 
But yeah, that definitely reads balloon-like now. Even with the soft shadows from him on it. I like 0.25. How low is that? Um, so the emissive colors, the way that this is working, the emissive color is whatever value is being pumped out of the lerp. So it's uh, it's really, really low, right? It, it's, well, the maximum is one, the minimum is zero. I'm not getting anything above that. Um, and then what I'm doing is that I'm just multiplying that by a quarter. So that means that instead of the emissive value being from zero to one, the emissive value is zero to 25. And so, yeah, so it definitely gets to a point where uh, it feels, it feels like rubber, right? It feels like the light emanating through the object instead of, uh, instead of elsewhere. Again, I've got it, like, it's, it's on the, uh, the rope, too. I didn't bother going in and uh, using, using my mask here. Um, you know, I should actually be multiplying this again. Make sure the rope doesn't glow. But just a really insanely low value of that red. The other thing that I can do is I can turn the... See there? See the, the rope's not glowing now? Um, which, again, you know, sells the illusion of these, these being made out of separate pieces or separate materials. Um, the other thing that I could do with this is, uh, is set that emissive glow to be light. Um, so that if the balloon is really close to a wall like this, you'll actually get a glow of red around the balloon uh, that'll make it look like the light bouncing off the object. It's almost like fake ray tracing if I do that. Uh, but I'm also going to have to put the balloon, because it's got no collision, um, I'm going to have to like put it somewhere near like this, like against a wall, um, so that it's uh, people don't like walk through it. I don't know if I told you guys this or not either, but I messed, I started messing with my kids um, in that uh, I moved, I moved the audio cues and made them random. So now when you walk around, uh, there's one by the balloon here. And I had no idea what sound that was going to be. It's random every time it plays. Which, again, works really well with the balloon being there. But, uh, yeah, I don't remember where I put the other ones. There's one here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. One by the chair, too, I think. That one again. I need uh, I need more audio. I've only got four sounds, and it's I I really notice walking around that I hear the same four sounds over and over again. But anyway, it is definitely getting there. So now, now all of the systems are complete, with the exception of the email system. So once people click that pick up item, I need to instantiate the email system, which is going to email both me and the user, um, whatever it is that they've chosen. So I'm going to make a series of cards, uh, just images that are going to get emailed as well. Um, and, uh, and that should, uh, I'll put that image up on screen. So it tells them who they, who they are, and then, uh, they'll get an email that'll, uh, that'll tell them about their creature and whatnot. And so, uh, that's most of the system built. Now it's just a matter of like pounding out assets and getting the art side of things done and troubleshooting and bug bug fixing, making sure that the system works over and over and over again. And so there you have it. I'm going to call that a night. Uh, I've got uh, a good uh, good hold on this now. So all I've got to do now is just write the email system and uh, and have that email me whenever anybody selects anything and then just start modeling. Uh, once I hit the modeling phase of this, I should be able to create maybe two or three assets a night. 
um, in order to start pumping these things out. And so I'm hoping that'll uh, that'll be enough to fill up the environment and uh, get me to a point where I'm uh, I'm good to go. And so you now it didn't take me long to prattle off the balloon. Once I've got an idea as to where I'm, I'm going with it, it, it's not that bad. And so, yeah, thanks for hanging out and watching, and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow night.